digitized for years. Digital really is the creator of Brightspace, which is the learning system that we're using today for the courses of postgraduate courses, and which we use as well in a test that we made for the digital plan of Itagui and the municipality of Itagui. I'd also like to say as to John, he's an important player for digital learning. He, I would say that D2L, since it was created, has gone through different settings, some difficult, some interesting, really trying to open spaces for digital learning and to have a healthy ecosystem for these systems. So it's really a pleasure to have you here with us, John, and your team, Jeremy, Elliot, Mario, and Camila. You're all from D2L. And the, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, Rutaene will have an event it's called D2L Connection in Medellin. And John and his team accept, or accepted to, to be with us here in AFIT. It's the first time he comes to the campus, first time even in Medellin, Colombia. And we'll have the opportunity to hear his insight on online education to have a conversation that we've had since last year on digital learning. We've heard different insights in this process and really for us Brightspace is key for the digital platform of, this, of the university and so it is in the future. So let's begin this discussion with people who have a global insight and to seek uh, better opportunities for the university. John, welcome. The floor is yours. Gracias. Hola, hasta ahí llega mi, mi español, más o menos. Es un placer estar con ustedes hoy. Caminando por, el, por la universidad, me dio la idea de que los canadienses y los colombianos son muy parecidos. A usted no les gusta que el fútbol le digan así y el soccer y también el hockey es de hielo, entonces para mí es, es entiendo la palabra del soccer y el fútbol en inglés. Es así. Bueno, para mí realmente es mi segundo viaje para Medellín, hace cuatro años y medio vine y realmente la región me impactó, la gente, la pasión, la dedicación, el hub de innovación que tiene la ciudad, cómo se centra en la transformación digital, en la educación, cosas que para mí fueron increíbles de ver, de ver cómo se construye de primera mano y de ser parte de una delegación donde pude visitar diferentes instituciones, entre ellas Ruta N, y no solo entender qué sucede en Medellín, sino a lo largo del país. Y para mí es fenomenal el cambio. Cuando le dije a mi esposa que venía a la ciudad más peligrosa del mundo, ella al principio se asustó, sí, pero le dije que hacía cuatro años y medio había venido y que la gente que era maravillosa. Y creo que estoy viendo una enorme transformación. There we go. So here's a few pictures of my last trip here. I'll hopefully have a few more. Uh, we actually visited uh, students in this uh, YMCA, YMCA here uh, locally. And uh, Alejandro and uh, Gabriel, uh, we actually sponsored to come to Canada. And actually, they spent time with the Governor General. So this was on a state visit. Uh, and the, uh, those kids were truly impressive for me. When I was visiting them in that uh, small classroom, uh, they talked about how uh, you know, initially they, you know, they weren't sure what they were going to be doing with their life, but they became so passionate because of the opportunity through di digital technology to become what they called teachers, helping their uh, fellow classmates learn how to use technology, uh, but also and grandparents using technology. And you can just hear the pride uh, 
in their voices as they talked about how pursuing this path of education was changing their life. We also visited the small school up in the mountains uh, where we actually got to see firsthand the, the power of uh, some of the technology being used uh, to tr transform some of these smaller, smaller schools. And I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing with EA Feet on being able to pursue a digital transformation strategy for a number of the schools around the, the local area. Uh, I think we're just getting started. I think there's a lot of potential for where we're gonna go in the future. Uh, and that comes from building these types of partnerships. I also have to say there's another connection to Columbia for me. And I was actually supposed to meet with your president the day my second daughter was born. And, uh, and my wife said, well, maybe you can still fly up there after the baby's born. I said, this is a trick question. <laughs> That's probably not happening. Uh, I, I, this was your previous president, President Santos. And I met him on a couple of other occasions in the past. Uh, and again, yet, you know, a good example of leadership really investing to make sure that uh, education is being supported and innovation is being supported. And I think uh, with the orange economy uh, paper, the digital transformation investments that are being made here in the country today, I think you're well set up to really lead the world, hopefully, uh, in and really having an impact on the quality of education across the country. So thank you for the work that you're doing every day. I wanted to talk a, a little around the future of uh, learning, future of work, and where it's going. And then I wanted to open it up to a few questions at the end. So before we get to the questions, I just want to share a little uh, our story and a little of what we've, we're seeing as the future of work and the future of learning. Now, the, this is being translated. Are you, am I talking too quickly? Or am I doing OK? okay. <laughs> a little too fast? <laughs> so um, just to give you a little bit of my story. So I was uh, 22 years old when I started D2L. And I was in my third year of university studying engineering. Uh, at that time, I was wrestling with one key question what's the most important problem that I could solve that would have the biggest impact on the world? Uh, and I couldn't think of anything more important than trying to transform the way the world learns. Uh, because education has this ripple effect. Not only does it impact the person they're educating, but it ripples through their family, their community, uh, and even from one generation to the next. I, I don't think of, I can't think of another problem out there that's uh, so important for us to solve and really trying to do our best to help each individual student reach their full potential. Uh, because it has this lasting impact. It helps us tackle the big challenges that lie ahead. Uh, and so when we started D2L, uh, the first wave of this was really taking the traditional classrooms that didn't look much like this, by the way, uh, and thinking about how do we put those online? How do we actually take what was traditionally be done from submitting assignments on paper uh, to Dropbox to now submitting that assignment online. Or being able to, instead of writing down grades by hand or annotating documents by hand, how do we do that online? Uh, taking quizzes online, communicating with students online. That first wave of transformation was, was a really important one. Uh, but this next wave of transformation in education that's coming, uh, I think it's going to be even bigger. I'll get to that in a second. So what's the, con uh, you know, what's, the, what's the context for this? So uh, here you talk a lot about the fourth industri industrial revolution. Uh, this is the orange economy, uh, automation, artificial intelligence, technology sweeping through almost every different industry. Uh, and that's having a major impact on how we educate and how we reskill and upskill uh, the workforce. Uh, but it's also creating a lot of anxiety. Uh, folks today, if you look at all the different data points, are more anxious than they were last year. Uh, there's all kinds of studies in the U.S. and other markets talking about anxiety. And Marshall McLuhan uh, had a great quote, and this was from 60 years ago. He said, our anxiety comes apart of today's problems with yesterday's tools and yesterday's concepts. Uh, that's our great opportunity for us is how do we think about new ways of tackling these challenges that lie ahead. Uh, if you look at the World Economic F uh, Forum, they say the life expectancy of a skill is now three to five years. 
So students that are starting engineering today, in, this, in these classrooms today, that are being taught these hard skills, by the time they graduate, those skills may not actually be relevant anymore. Think about that for a moment. That's an incredible pace of change. Uh, and, and it asks us, it begs us to rethink how we actually tackle uh, our education system and, and work. Now there's a few links. Uh, we can share the PowerPoint, so you don't have to write down the long URLs. Uh, but we've published a couple white papers on this around the future of work uh, and the future of skills uh, that are not marketing pieces, sort of future looking, here's where work is going, here's where, here's, here's where skills development is going. Uh, there's a, a bank in Canada, that's the largest bank, that's spending a half a billion dollars uh, over the next 10 years to reskill and upskill their employees because they don't think bank tellers are going to exist in their bank in the very near future. So they're spending time to go, how do we actually give them the skills that we as a bank are going to need in the future? And they're having that open conversation. Uh, McKinsey Global Institute talks about how there's uh, going to be about 350 million people displaced from their jobs over the next 12 years. Uh, I don't think there's going to be less jobs 12 years from now. I think there's just going to be very different jobs 12 years from now. Uh, and I don't think we've ever seen in history uh, the pace of change that we're seeing today, which begs us to respond to the challenge and try new innovative ways to, to tackling uh, the future of work and the future of, of learning. And this, by the way, this isn't just banks. If you talk to folks at Google, you talk to folks at Microsoft, you talk to folks at Boeing, you talk to folks in any technology company, they talk about how they have to reskill and re-educate re their engineers uh, all the time as well. This isn't just, you know, uh, the workers in FedEx trying to reposition people that were moving boxes because robots are coming in. This is spanning across every field, every industry. So, uh, I just want to share, by the way, this is not all doom and gloom. Uh, I want to share a few examples of how people are trying to tackle this challenge. Uh, and, I, and I'll just give you a little context. So I'm from the University of Waterloo. I studied at the University of Waterloo. I did systems design engineering there. Uh, I think you have a great design engineering program here as well, too. Uh, and Waterloo is famous for being the world's largest cooperative education program. Meaning, as an engineer, I would do four months of, of school, and then I would be four months at a, in a job placement, and then I'd be back at school for four months, and then I would be back at work for four months for a total of five years. I thought that was just normal. I, I, I had no idea how rare that was until I started visiting schools all over the world. And in Canada, Canada has just set a goal of having 100%, 100% of all students in all disciplines in every university, in every college, getting at least one work integrated learning experience. So whether that's an apprenticeship, a co-op like I received, uh, internships, it could be you have, uh, discovery and creation here is one of your fields, uh, the ability to do research, uh, it could be service learning, it could be a hackathon, it could be working, uh, working to build uh, a startup, as part of like an accelerator or an incubator. But basically, define here are the different types of work integrated learning experiences. And the goal is to give every student at least one of those opportunities. And, and why? Uh, the hope is that we want to make sure that um, uh, these students, as they graduate from school, have the skills that are going to be needed for the employers uh, today. Now, there's actually a little bit more to it than that. Uh, the, the other nice thing about work integrated learning is that these students actually feed back to the university the ideas, the new best practices, the new strategies in terms of what's being employed in the workplace, the new skills that need to be developed. And so it's the ability now to uh, create like this virtual uh, uh, feedback cycle, if you will, where all of a sudden now students uh, are giving back to the university ideas uh, through work term reports or otherwise. And the universities are benefiting from that new knowledge and adapting the curriculum, adapting how they teach as they go forward. So that's one powerful way of doing it. 
you know, I, I also believe there's all kinds of different types of technologies that you'll hear about. Everything from uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, uh, online learning, uh, blended learning, where we're using technology, kind of like what we're doing right now, where this is being captured uh, and being shared. So the idea of using technology in the classroom, using it for fully online. Uh, and then there's new models of education that are being developed, uh, leveraging this type of technology. Now, why do I bring this up? Like, I think these technologies are going to help. But uh, interestingly, I actually think it's the technologies that are actually going to be able to help us make the education system more human. Uh, it's the ability for us to give better feedback to students. Uh, how do we leverage technologies to help automate giving feedback? So, you know, as a client, I don't know, how many have tried our intelligent agents tool within the system? Or it's like a little virtual assistant that we've built to give feedback. No one yet? Okay, so there's an opportunity. So uh, a, a great example is uh, there's a university in Australia, Deakin University, where a faculty member teaching in a large lecture hall, uh, intro to psychology or you know, health behavior, uh, and she uses these intelligent agents to send little notes to the students automatically. So if a student is struggling in a particular assignment, uh, the note goes to them and says, I noticed you were struggling. Uh, here's some support you're going to need for the next assignment. And by the way, uh, here's some help uh, seeking behaviors that you should start to exemplify by coming to see me at office hours. Uh, and so it's the ability for you to have a communication to the student, go out to them. So it's, you think, uh, it's, it, it's an automated message, but it looks like it comes from the faculty member. Uh, and the students will pick up on the fact that it, it is an automated message. There won't be any you know, hiding of it. Uh, but 99 out of 100 will value that feedback because you've taken the time to craft that message. So there's technologies like that. It doesn't have to be like artificial intelligence uh, doing machine learning and, ad and adaptive learning. It could be just simply helping you give better feedback to individual students to help keep them on track for success. That, that to me is where we start to leverage this technology to make the educational experience more human. Uh, and if you look at uh, the, the big challenges around completion rates or improving outcomes or helping keep students engaged, feedback, by the way, is one of the, the best uh, strategies to use to, to give them a reason to persist to overcome all the obstacles they have in their way for, for learning. I also think uh, we can also learn a little bit from history. And by the way, I, I love visiting your campus. I think you've got a representation of like uh, one of the early Greek uh, meeting spaces for uh, getting together and having conversations and, and education. Am, am I mistaken? Is that correct? Yep. There we go. Uh, that's, I, I took a picture of that. <laughs> Uh, I actually think we can learn a lot from history. Uh, now, uh, for me, I, I sit on a, a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council in Canada. And uh, that Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council grants about $700 million a year, Canadian, so uh, to, to researchers that are focusing in on the transformation of education or uh, other key priority years. The transformation of higher education in particular has been the number one priority year for the last five years. And Robert Gibbs is on that board with me, and he's a humanities prof, and I've really like, grown to like him. Uh, and he actually uh, ha wrote an unpublished book. I don't know why he hasn't published it yet. And it, there's a term in there that I pulled out. It's called settled knowledge. So settled knowledge are all the things that we try to teach kids that we already know. Uh, so it's uh, math, it's languages, it's, uh, it's uh, the sciences. It's all the things that they need to know to be well equipped for whatever profession they're going to go into in the future. So if they're going to be a nurse, they really need to be taught a lot of settled knowledge before they go walk into an operating room. Or if they're going to be an engineer and building a bridge, they really need to have a lot of settled knowledge before they go off and build that bridge safely. Uh, and I think it's okay for us to teach settled knowledge. Like that's, no one's going to argue that we shouldn't be teaching that. Uh, the challenge is that there's more and more settled knowledge being created every single day. There's more things that we have to teach them every day. And there's only so much time in the day. How many of you are feeling like they have lots of time in their day to teach everything that they ever wanted to teach? Nobody. <laughs> uh, 
there's not enough time. So that, that's a challenge. Now, there's, a, there's another definition. And uh, in, in, in English, and I had the Spanish version of this. In English, study uh, is all about mental effort. It's about attentive. It's careful. It reminds me of cramming for an exam. But if you actually look at the old Latin root of the word study from like over a thousand years ago, uh, it talks about zeal, affection, passion, desire, pursuit. It talks about studying in a different way. Uh, and I think uh, a great education should actually reflect the old Latin root of the word study. So being a better musician, you have a great music program here. Being a better musician, being a better entrepreneur, being a better researcher, uh, pursuing problems that exist in your community, like setting education policy for digital transformation for you know, communities that are, that are going through big transformations. Uh, solving little problems in our community, solving the really big problems. Uh, that original Latin root of the word study is something we should reboot. <laughs> we need to, to, to remake the university to sort of reflect that. Uh, and I think it's a, it's, a grand, it's a great challenge because on one side of it, you know, we're trying to teach, oh, sorry, all this settled knowledge. And on the other side, we now need to get the balance right and reboot that old definition of study so we can equip this next generation of students to go off and tackle the big challenges that exist in our society. Um, we also, at D2L, over the last 20 years, I can't believe I've been at this for 20 years, building technology. My parents were both educators. My grandfather was an educator. I was the black sheep, and I went down the engineering pathway. Uh, but you know, one of the things that uh, they always taught me was that uh, it was really important to reach every student in their class. Try not to leave anyone behind. And that's a big challenge, uh, especially in the traditional classrooms. And so when we started D2L, we, we started with you know, asking questions. Like what barriers exist to helping each student get the best possible educational experience? And no one had any problems listing off a, a long list of problems that exist in education. Whether it's, uh, if you're blind, how do you participate? If you're deaf, how do you participate? Uh, if you have different learning disabilities, if you, you know, uh, are in a remote community, if you don't have access to technology, uh, there are a long list of reasons why education uh, was, was going to be hard for you. Uh, you know, a, a great example is, you know, um, is accessibility. When we started D2L, if you were blind, you couldn't participate equally. Uh, we're proud. We're, the National Federation of the Blind champions the use of D2L in universities. Because if you're blind, you can sign in just like every other student. You can participate in this exact same class, go through the exact same material. And you're equally able to complete that course, complete that program, and go on and achieve you know, a lot with your life. And so. For me, uh, trying to make this educational system more inclusive, not to uh, reduce the excellence, because I think excellence is still has to be the critical uh, you know, beacon of hope, if you will. Uh, but we have to try to find ways to provide better access. Uh, and we have to try to make ways to make the educational experience more inclusive. Uh, and so that's another big part of the challenge as we, as we tackle uh, the, bigger, the bigger picture. Now, I'm proud of the work that we're doing all around the world. I, I need to replace the UCC uh, picture here, by the way, with, uh, with e EA. Uh, don't tell them. <laughs> uh, you've got, a, you've got a, a great campus here. You're doing some amazing work. And I'm really proud of the work that we're doing together. Uh, in Brazil, uh, we work with uh, clients uh, to help lift uh, thousands of women out of poverty. Uh, in Libya, we're working to support entrepreneurship across the entire country, even in a war-torn environment. So when people tell you, you know, uh, the technology that you're, is a barrier to accessing education, you can say, well, D2L is actually doing this in Libya, which is a war-torn country, where the internet is very variable. <laughs> and so uh, it's possible. You know, it requires online, offline, uh, and it requires different ways of approaching it. 
And one of the one of the ones is, for example, mobile responsive design. How many uh, have a mobile phone in the room here today? Everybody has a mobile phone. Anyone not have a mobile phone? Okay. Uh, uh, what I didn't know is uh, a lot of students. Uh, that's the only device they have. They make a choice between laptop or phone. They don't choose both. Uh, and so, you know, it was the reason why we, we decided to build the technology in a way that supported what we call responsive design. So no matter what device, brand new, second hand, third hand, each of those students could actually access the learning experiences that you're building here at the university. Uh, and we're, we're still the only ones that do that in our space. Uh, and, an, and another big one that we've been working on, it's just a little picture there, is around this concept around uh, competency-based education, or EBC, I think is the way that you pronounce it here. Uh, and competency-based education is a new way of doing education. And for me, this is, gives us time to do that uh, new reboot of study. Uh, competency-based education, what we found is it takes about half the amount of time to go through the material as a student. You score higher on exams, and you retain the knowledge for a lot longer. And so why, why is that important? Well, it gives us the ability to, if, for example, students don't have the right foundation, to understand, well, what key you know, outcomes are, or competencies or skills do they need to have? So let's give them the right remediation to get them on track as quickly as we can. Uh, or if they're a student that wants to pursue mastery, like they want to go off and do a master's program or other types of learning, how do we give them enrichment pathways to sort of you know, jump ahead? Uh, but it ensures that every student has that right foundation as they move forward while still saving time. And you can use that time to do entrepreneurship, boot camps, cooperative education, other types of models of education that really help those students reach their full potential. Uh, the one, down, one picture in the corner there is Sinclair College. They have students that come back from serving in the military and take six months to complete a four-year program uh, because they've already had that educational experience, but what they haven't gotten was the degree to recognize it. Uh, and so they're able to go through an educational experience a lot faster. But for your more traditional students, it's the ability for them to come on campus, acquire that settled knowledge to be an engineer, to be a doctor, to be a business uh, leader, but then have more time to explore the other more human aspects, the, the, uh, the entrepreneurial exploration, the research exploration. Th those key pieces are, are a critical part of that education of the future. So folks, that was a, a lot to cover in a very tight time frame. Uh, and I just want to just say thank you uh, for the work that you're doing. Thank you for providing the education that you're providing to each of your students. Uh, thank you for investing in making sure that uh, uh, helping those students reach their full potential is something you, you do e each and every day. Uh, and I'm really proud that you're providing them that hope, that inspiration, and that guidance to be successful as they, as they move forward in their careers. So with that, I wanted to open it up for questions. So thank you very much. Gracias. And I've got a, someone can do translation if you have a question as well too for me. <laughs> Por favor, levante la mano y utilice el micrófono. This is more a discussion than a Q&A session per se. And the idea is to take the opportunity to take your insights, really, pick on your brain, John, and to discuss critical things for our institution. Here we have mics. If, if anybody would like to make a question, please raise your hand, and we can provide you a question. Let me begin then. John, you mentioned and it's well known the importance of skilling and upskilling today. I'm always curious about the speed how, of these processes compared to the their average lifespan. I mean, how can we remain in the race of skilling 
if I improve the skills of a person today, and in three years I, I have to go through it again, how can I remain in the race? Because if the average life span of skills is shorter and shorter, people do take time to learn at a certain pace. So how do you get out of that? Is it, is it a dilemma or not? Or is it not that difficult? Uh, no, this is hard. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I don't think there's an easy path here. Um, you know, a lot of folks are recommending, and, and we do as well, focusing on the durable skills. So problem solving, critical thinking, uh, communication, leadership, ethics, uh, creativity. Uh, those durable skills, uh, they'll survive all the different technologies that come and go. So that's more of a traditional liberal arts <laughs> kind of experience. But I think weaving that into the curriculum uh, for students to give them the skills that they're going to need to, to learn and relearn and relearn throughout their entire journey is a critical, uh, critical component of this, in my opinion. Uh, and then you still need to teach the hard skills. You still need to teach them languages to use for programming. Um, and I can tell you, uh, the languages we use to program at D2L are very different than the languages I, I learned uh, when going through the university experience. And Waterloo is famous for computer science and engineering, but they're just different languages. Um, but because of that combination of those durable skills, those human skills, uh, combined with uh, being able to translate what happened with one you know, technical language for programming, moving those skills over to another language is, was a lot easier. And so, you know, uh, I think we've got to be able to shrink the half-life of acquiring these skills. So I think uh, concepts like competency-based education are a great model for us to make it easier to, to, to get through that educational experience, pick up those new skills faster, because those technical skills are still required. You can't be a great engineer without picking up those skills. You can't be a computer scientist without picking up those skills. Uh, so those are still uh, very much required. Uh, but you know, as universities, we have to stay on the cutting edge of this. And that's not easy. You know, uh, you know for example, in, in our software stack, we've had to rebuild our software stack you know, four times over the last 20 years, completely. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be relevant anymore. And, and so for us, that's a constant re-education of our engineers, constantly learning new languages, constantly learning new technology stacks. Uh, and you have to invest in it. But I, uh, I think it's a combination of the things that I've talked about that allow you to be more nimble uh, and, and really help equip these students with the skills they're going to need to be successful in the future. Does that help answer yep. this? Okay. Hey, alguien, Carlos. Laura, Hi. How do we actually uh, do that? Uh, well, that's a, that's a great question. So there's, there's three key pillars to uh, universal accessibility or inclusion. So the, the platform itself has to be accessible. So uh, I'm proud to say we're the only platform that's fully accessible. So if you're blind or deaf, you can use everything within D12 just like anyone else that's sighted or has you know, uh, no issues. So that's sort of stage one. Uh, stage two is this concept around making your content accessible. So how do you build content uh, that's accessible? So we have a little accessibility checker. So just like you would do spell check, now you can do accessibility check. And it would automatically tell you, here's where you're going to have problems within your content. 
Uh, and we've also gone a little step further and we've actually built templates so that you can, if you use a template that we've, we've helped you build, uh, it'll make the content not only accessible, but it'll help you actually make it responsive as well. So if students are learning on a mobile phone, they're able to participate equally with everybody else that's using a laptop. Uh, so use those templates, use those checkers. And then third is this concept around universal design for learning. Uh, UDL, is that a term? Okay, perfect, universal design. And universal design at, at the core, by the way, if I've got my back to you a lot, I should maybe back up a little. You're okay, is this normal for you? <laughs> Uh, universal design for learning is, is how you sort of really start to tackle this. So uh, one student might have one learning activity and another student might have a different learning activity, but they actually tie back to the same outcome. Uh, and so if a student, uh, you know, uh, has, you know, challenges with uh, motor control and they can't complete a certain type of task, they're given another type of a task. Or if they're blind, they can't do that, then they're given another type of task. And so, uh, the, the goal is, there may be certain professions where if you're blind, you're, you're not going to be a, an optometrist. Uh, maybe not today. But there may be uh, things within optometry that, that you can do if you're blind. Uh, and so the ability for us to figure that out from a curriculum perspective, to say, well, here's a pathway for you, that's another, that's another big uh, effort that is required as you, as you look at your academic planning. Does that help? So those three things, and then what we're trying to do is make it as easy as possible to support all three of those things. Um, to create those adaptive pathways, to have accessibility checkers, and to make sure the platform itself natively supports any phone or any device. Yeah. Thank you. John, hi. thanks very much again for uh, this um, conversation. I have actually a follow-up question from what Carlos asked regarding um, skills or digital literacy in faculty, particularly and employees, right? Because now we have uh, the challenge that most of the time the students already know how to work these tools, okay? Because they have, they are used to. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, based on the experience from your company, how have you, appro have you approach what have you learned from that experience? It's probably the best way or the tips, you know, the key points to reach also that um, a digital literacy in faculty to help, you know, make all this work together. To, uh, to do all of this? I mean, uh, to do, yeah, so to, to uh, be able to use the tools that have yeah. been developed with all these three um, pillars that you mentioned before, yeah. but to be really um, uh, use useful for the faculty yeah. Uh, in the classrooms with the students, considering that they are the experts in the digital, in yeah. the digital area. Yeah, the, the students have no trouble with this. <laughs> sure. uh, I, think, uh, th I think the key is uh, locally is uh, academic to academic, sharing best practices, uh, having workshops on this conversation. Uh, we have lots of webinars and resources you can use. Um, and uh, being able to create a community of practice here within the university and possibly for the region uh, because I don't know how well this is being tackled across all of the country but you've got a you've got a great opportunity to lead the way on making education more inclusive uh, and using technology to do it but I, I this is uh, you're right there's some of this is just you just simply use a tool and you click the little button that says accessibility checker and it's really easy uh, but other parts of this around universal design is, is a great opportunity, working with the Center for uh, Digital Learning, uh, working with uh, other folks that are actually trying this or pioneering it, building that showcase. So here's how it's done right. And then hopefully, you know, we'll see posters come out of this, we'll see presentations come out of this, and we'll see faculty building that community practice. Uh, Jeremy, like, yeah, and professional development. And use, yeah, you actually use the tool itself to do professional development on this topic. It's a great idea. Yeah. Um, going back to, to, to tools uh, and, and what, what uh, Ernesto was saying, um, it, it seems to us that uh, now students and faculty and everyone comes to the university with their own cloud of things. Yeah. I mean, 
they will have their own digital identity on Gmail or whatever, right. yeah. some, some other providers. But every one of us is running around with a lot of clouds in our heads, uh, with a lot of personal <laughs> services, so to speak. Yeah. And when, when you get to the university, uh, you, you get in touch with a lot of new tools, uh, yeah. particularly the, the LMS. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, you, you use the LMS for uh, structural learning, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to make it uh, integrate with all those personal clouds. That's right. I, I would say that's something that will, will be more pressing in the future, right? And, and I, I would like to, to, to ask a bit about uh, what's your take on the future of the LMS? As, yeah. a, as a component of that learning ecosystem uh, yeah. that we will be having to work with, because yeah. uh, definitely we, we can we can develop some experiences there, but there will be a lot of other places that mm -hmm. that are competing for the attention of every one of us, not only of the students. Yeah. Um, so so what's the take of D2L? Your take uh, on, on 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 the future of the LMS? Yeah. Where, where is that going? Well, that's a big question. Um, so I, I don't think, uh, by the way, I, I'm a big fan of the uh, calling the technology a learning platform or a learning environment. Uh, a learning management system just seems too corporate -y to me. Uh, so I'm a much bigger fan of the term uh, learning environment or learning platform. And when we think about the learning platform, we, we don't think about it as a walled garden. Uh, we think about it as a way for us to have an open ecosystem. So if people want to uh, plug in their Gmail documents or, or, or Google documents or their Office 365 documents or any number of, a th like we have over f at least 4,000 different applications that plug in to the learning platform. Uh, and so uh, they should be able to carry those resources, carry those tools uh, into the classroom, submit assignments from Google Docs, submit assignments from Office 365, submit it from whatever they're using in their personal cloud, if you will. And that goes for faculty too. So if faculty, if they're comfortable, if they've got documents stored somewhere, we should be able to just make it easy for them to pull those into the learning environment. I don't think uh, the learning environment itself is going to go away uh, because you, you need something to manage learning uh, to actually create an environment. So uh, being able to assign learning outcomes, be able to track uh, assessment against those learning outcomes, being able to help the learners build a learner record and a profile of their achievements, to issue badges and to do a whole bunch of other activities that go around that core practice of learning, to create the right learning moments, to integrate the right, right learning moments. And if you talk to students about the bigger cloud stuff, uh, their biggest complaint is having to sign into 100 different applications. So being able to go to one spot to participate in learning, to be able to communicate with their classmates, to be able to launch off into other types of experiences, I think that's, that's a big part of the future. Um, Malcolm Brown from Educause, I've spent a lot of time, Jeremy has spent a lot of time with these folks as well, helping to map out what's called the next generation digital learning environment. I'm a very big fan of uh, the thinking around a lot of that work. And that's thinking about these things as loosely coupled systems that enable, uh, I'm hoping you're doing well with all this <laughs> translation, uh, that enable us to really uh, work collaboratively with other tools. I don't think we're going to do video conferencing, but maybe we will in the future. I don't think we're going to. Uh, so how do we integrate that in? We're not going to compete with Google on Google Docs. So how do we integrate those things in? That's, uh, you know, thinking about the, the learning environment as a walled garden like we did in the past, I think that's, that's, those are days long over. Yeah. Does that help? Absolutely. And the learning environment itself is going to evolve tremendously. So. If you look at where we're investing right now, 100% of our R&D goes back into helping our clients with the tools they use each and every day. Whether that's better analytics or better machine learning or better feedback mechanisms, better assessment tools. Uh, there's a new tool coming out called Quick Eval that's arriving, is it this month or next month? May. Close, we're almost there. Like Qu Quick Eval is a way for you to just manage all of your evaluations, uh, all from one hub outside of the, the constraints of a, uh, a course even. So it's tied to you as a faculty member or, or a tutor. So you go in and you see all the things that you have to grade or assess across everything, whether it's a discussion post, a quiz, uh, an assignment that's been submitted, and just be able to do it from that one location. So how do we make those experiences that you do each and every day better? Uh, how do we enable annotation on those documents? How do we do all of those common practices around learning? That's where we're focused. 
We want to make those experiences uh, delightful. We want you to say, I love that experience. Uh, yeah, I can talk a lot about future yeah, stuff. Is, is, is that, is, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really uh, interested in that uh, because I, I would say that uh, from an, an institutional perspective, uh, maybe there's a lot of tension sometimes about our data, our platforms, mm -hmm. and maybe it's, I, I would say that it takes time, in my view, what I get to see across the, our region. It takes time to, to move there, to think about integration, to think about openness in that sense, uh, both in the technology aspect of integration and also when you think about open access mm -hmm. and open scholarship and, and uh, uh, many, many different aspects of, of what open means and the possibilities that you get with openness to reach every learner. Uh, yeah. But I, 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 I don't know, I, I still have the feeling that it takes time to get there. It, it does take time, and not every faculty member, not every program needs to do it today, right? So, uh, like, I've, when you talk about virtual reality, we have lots of clients doing virtual reality, but it's not every faculty member doing virtual reality. <laughs> uh, and so, same thing goes with open. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, the University of Tasmania, which is in uh, Australia, so a little island off the coast of Australia, and the University of Tasmania has one of the most successful massive open online courses in the world. It has 75,000 people that take the course a year. And of the, of the students that start, nearly 80% finish. It's unheard of in big open programs. And it's a course on dementia. And that course on dementia has opened up access to folks that want to learn about dementia all over the country, all over the world. Uh, and it's huge enrollment growth in their dementia program at the university. Uh, and so, you know, folks are using these types of strategies to employ ways to grow the university, but they're also using it as a way to open up access uh, and really build the brand of the university as well, too. So there's that part of it. But I, I think there's another piece there around who owns the data and who controls the data. And uh, you own the data, just so we're clear. You own the data, you control the data, right? So it's D2L is not exerting control or ownership. Uh, and so uh, that's, not all, that's not all cloud providers, by the way. <laughs> you know, that's, that's our approach to working with, uh, with folks in education, is that you, you really should have ownership and control of your data. Uh, so why? I, I actually think, like, uh, how many follow artificial intelligence or are thinking about artificial intelligence? Anyone? Some? Okay, so artificial intelligence is a, a great reason on why we need to give you access to data. So uh, with artificial intelligence, what it, what it really is, is is driving a prediction. It's saying, we predict these students are going to drop out. We predict this learning pathway will be a better learning pathway. We predict whatever it might predict. There's a whole bunch of different tools that are built around this. But if we give you access to that data, give you access to that model, then all of a sudden you can say, well, actually, no, that student is not going to drop out. Here's reasons why. The uh, person that actually makes the judgment call is the faculty member or the student. And if, and if we actually give them more data, more predictions, uh, then they're able to sharpen those judgment skills. They're able to make the right calls. They're able to take the right actions. And uh, most people think about it as a, a task automation or a judgment machine. And it's not a judgment machine. It's a prediction machine. And we need to equip. Uh, these students with the ability to actually make their own decisions, make their own judgment calls. Uh, and so there's a lot, of, a lot of ground to cover with that open conversation. But at the core of it is it's around equipping you with the right skills, the right insights, to take the right actions to help people achieve their most, the most they can in their life, or to provide an increased opportunity for access. These are deep questions, folks. <laughs> And by the way, is, uh, not just folks in Columbia wrestling with this. Uh, no matter where I go in the world, everyone is wrestling with these questions. Hi. So Hi. I have a question that I think I'm going to make it in Spanish. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? My question is, everything sounds very digital, like we're guided more towards getting into that type of reality, but with the environmental crisis of our planet, I think it's complicated to 
to separate and to not be sensitive to the nature and even to other human beings and everything that's happening on the planet. So how can you balance digital worlds and the physical world? And we have to be connected to the world and to the future of our planet. So I love that question. I, I really do. And I think that gets at the heart of what we're trying to do with the technology. I used to think about it as just, we need to make everything digital. And that's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is make the educational experience more human. Uh, and it's the yin and yang. It's the, uh, it's the balance, balancing act that we have to do. If we can get more efficient with how we teach certain types of experiences, uh, certain types of knowledge, then we can free up time to better connect with the world, connect with the environment, connect with our communities, connect with our people. And that's the real human part of study. That's the real human connection points. Uh, and so I think we've got to get the right balance. I think, uh, you know, folks are sort of saying it's one or the other, and it's not. It's got to be a combination of the two. Otherwise, we won't have time to really build those connections, and we won't be able to provide the reach to be able to do the transformations we need to do. Um, and, but I, I'm, I, I hear you. I, I think that's, that is like a, a key question. I agree. And you, you see that here on your campus, by the way. Right? When you walk in between the buildings, they're open. The, you kind of just flow naturally into the environment. Uh, whoever did the design here was very purposeful on making sure it was uh, well crafted. Now, I'm sure you probably have lots of ideas for how to make it better. But as someone that's visited a lot of campuses, I love the experience of walking from one building to another here. Um, and so if we can build our education system that empowers that, I think we're going to do a good job. So thank you. Good morning. Thank you for this morning's conversation. I'd like to ask you, at the university, we're working on curricular and digital transformation at the same time. In your experience, what, what should you converge where you can have both aspects, not only online, but really what are the process points in which in which we have a, a campus like ours in which we want to reach this transformation. Yeah, so I, I might need to have that paraphrased. Uh, but but I, I think what you're asking is, uh, you know, as, you, as you're going through this digital transformation, what, like what are the, uh, maybe the translation was a little bit off, like process points? The curricular transformation digital, yeah. We have two two big projects. Two different projects. Yeah. Uh, oh, got it. Yeah. It's, yes. uh, <laughs> it's not really. It's two projects, right? Um, a little bit of quick story. Uh, last year, the university um, create um, a new um, institutional development plan, plan that is called uh, the Itinerario Eafi. Uh, 2030, the itinerary EFIT 2030. That's uh, the, the plan that we hope it will take us to 2030. Okay? okay, and we are aligned with the challenges of the future and with the sustainable development goals. And there's a lot of uh, interesting things over there. A and we have 23 strategies that are sort of the, the, the map, the route map uh, for getting there. Uh, so we're tackling. Those, status, um, those strategies with two uh, initial projects that will be running the next few years. Uh, one is uh, about digital transformation, and the other is about curriculum transformation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, okay, in your view, uh, when you're thinking about digital transformation and curriculum transformation, what will be the intersection points? What will be the, the, the touch points between those two projects, between those two approaches to transformation? Yeah, uh, there's, there's probably a lot of touch points there, right? So, uh, so uh, first of all, I, th I think digitizing the curriculum is a, sort of a step one, so that you can actually help students understand, well, what's expected? So what are the outcomes, or what are the professional outcomes, or what are, what are uh, what terminology do you use? Outcomes, competency, skills, 
attributes? Uh, competencies. Competen what, are, what are the competencies uh, attached uh, to the particular program or programs that they might be taking? And then how do you have a picture of your progress towards achievement? So I, th I think just helping them understand what's expected of them is a, is a big part of it. Uh, and then you actually have another intersection point around, uh, well, how does, the, how does the curriculum change because of digital? And that's, that's a more interesting conversation. Uh, and it's a good, qu good, good question. So there's, there's probably a lot of uh, common practices like submitting an assignment or taking a quiz or doing assessments. Those can all go digital. Right, so if students are submitting like paper-based assignments today, there's no reason why they can't all go digital, or, or most of them go digital, uh, because you gain a lot of efficiencies. No one has ever complained about us automating the marking of a multiple choice uh, quiz. It's just, it's automated, it just makes that whole exercise easier, it gives back time, uh, and students enjoy the fact that they get an immediate answer to how they performed on that particular activity. So there's digitizing the activities that occur within. There could be different learning moments that get di digitized. Like uh, you could be thinking about uh, disaster scenarios uh, in engineering and being able to create a virtual reality experience or, or a lab uh, where you're using digital to, to help. Um, but I actually think the, the biggest transformation is, uh, is, is around what we talked about earlier, which is around this future skills. So if we know that uh, certain skills are gonna have a half-life of three to five years, or are gonna expire three to five years from now, not a half-life, <laughs> we're gonna have a half-life of three years, uh, then uh, what are the other skills that we're gonna need to equip uh, those students to be successful in that new digital world? Um, and then another area that I would talk about is work integrated learning. I don't know if you're thinking about that from a curriculum perspective, uh, but work integrated learning could be another way to sort of uh, tie back digital into this, where you can say, here are the work term reports, here's a, a professional development we're gonna give students while they're on these work experiences, uh, and then here's how we're gonna pull back industry's latest thinking in terms of how our programs are gonna change based upon um, uh, what's, what's happening in industry. So thinking about the digital as a way to like, gather inputs into uh, future curricular changes. How, how often can you change the curriculum? Is it, is it, is, are you changing curriculum once every five years, 10 years? Something like that. It depends on sometimes on regulation. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and yeah, the, the cycle is about four or five years. Okay, so, so in that case, uh, I, I would, yeah, we're gonna need to figure out a better way to do that. Because there are gonna be certain parts of the curriculum that are gonna be just fine for 10 years, maybe 20 years. And there are other parts of the curriculum uh, that will probably have to change on a more, more frequent basis. So for example, as, as an engineer studying engineering 20 years ago, you were taught about how to do project management, which is a good skill to have, but you won't walk into a software development shop that does waterfall uh, design anymore. They, it's all agile and it's all Kanbans and it's all different, different style of doing project management. Uh, and so there's those sub-elements of the curriculum that are probably gonna be, have to be left more flexible. And so as you're thinking about the digital transformations, you almost have to think about what's the half-life of this part of the curriculum. Like, do we think this curriculum is gonna survive 10 years until the next one? Or do we have to be, have some flexibility in the curriculum to say, we're gonna help you understand how to run a project. <laughs> and it could be one of many different ways, one of many different activities that could, could be supporting it. I'm, you know, but I, th I think it's, uh, if I was to give you one white paper to read, it's the future, future of Skills white paper that we have, because it really locks in, like, here are the skills that we think are gonna be durable uh, for the future, and it's, and it's a good read around that. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I would, would throw out there, just as like a little, little fun activity, is like attach a badge to major achievements all the way through. So uh, students as they're going through the program or going through the curriculum, getting a little recognition of achievement, uh, that they've achieved a certain mastery level of some sort of outcome. They're now you know, really good at agile development. They get a little badge that says they're an agile master. I don't know, whatever fun you might wanna have. You can do that now with digital. So those, those are some of the, I could go on for three hours on this topic, but I'll stop there. Um, I, I, I wanna, I'm, I'm full of questions today, yeah. it looks like. 
sorry everyone. Um, um, hopefully it's only today. So uh, maybe um, you could share with us a little bit of, of experiences that you found around about um, learning at scale. Mm. Because you, you, you mentioned something that, that I, I, I really like before. Uh, with this idea of um, a more human education system and the idea of reaching every learner, uh, there are places where you, will, you can go with technology and there are places where you won't be able to go with technology. So you have to find a balance between that. Um, AFID uh, is, a, is a member of a coalition for uh, learning at scale, the, uh, teacher professional development at scale on the Global South. So we, we are in touch with these kind of, of um, challenges. Uh, how do you get places where connectivity is not what we would expect, where, I mean, our, our reality is that. Uh, we have this um, uh, uh, collaboration with D2L uh, yeah. in Itagui, and uh, the, one of the, the results there is, well, our communities are still very, very, very uh, used to face-to-face -to -face conversation. And, and it's a very, very oral culture. So it's not, we're not that digital yet. And yeah. sometimes you can see that that's something bad. You have to get everyone to be digital quickly. Uh, but that's part of our culture. So how do you, how do you work with that? Uh, do you have maybe, maybe some, some experiences or, or some projects that you could, you could talk about? Well, that was an interesting report that came out of that project that we did together, right? So uh, there were challenges, and some of them were cultural. Like, like they're not quite ready to learn using technology. They're used to traditional experiences. Uh, that will change, right? So, uh, you would say the same thing about Canada 30 years ago, <laughs> or 20 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago. Um, they just weren't ready. Um, but I, I can tell you, um, like I went to the, one of the poorest communities in the world in India. It was a slum in India. Uh, they literally washed down the sidewalks so that when we went there, it was it was looked looked cleaner. Uh, and we went, walked into this classroom in this really poor slum, uh, and uh, and it was a classroom of girls, and they were showing us what they were learning. They were learning how to sew, and they were learning Excel ninety five. I know you're laughing, and, and, and one, this was five years ago, and, and one of the girls put up her hand, and she said, uh, when are you going to teach me something that matters? And I was like, wow, this, just, this trip just got really interesting. Uh, and I was there with the governor general's uh, wife, and, uh, and she, she stood up and said, well, I'll show you how to do some exercises. And she got up, and she was doing jumping jacks and a few exercises. And every girl in that class took out their smartphone and took a photo. This was five years ago, and I, and I put up my hand and I said, uh, how do you all have smartphones? And they said, well, these are third-hand phones, uh, they cost next to nothing, and uh, we just use Wi-Fi. And it was sort of a light bulb moment for me, which said, oh, the world has devices. What they don't have is access to great learning experiences, because the learning experiences don't work on those third-hand devices. And so that's why we did responsive design. That's why we said, no, like, this app thing is great, but if we do responsive design, it'll reach everybody. And then we went into war-torn environments like Libya, where you had to be online and offline. And I tell you, if you're trying to reach an entrepreneur in Libya with business education, which is what we're doing in, in, in Libya, uh, you know, they're passionate about learning, but they, they have to be able to download <laughs> those lessons and be able to synchronize back when they have access to the internet, whenever the internet comes back up. So that's a cultural change in terms of how we teach Right? So that's like, uh, instead of it having to be synchronous, like real time, how do we make it asynchronous so that we can, you know, deal with a situation where the community has been, you know, in a, in a bad situation for a particular time and be able to connect back up. It, in our labs, we've built completely offline versions of D2L. We've done all kinds of cool stuff. So there's things that are cooking to make it even easier. Uh, but I think a lot of it has to do with the professional development. It goes along with the teachers. And it also goes along with just over time, just being able to provide access to higher quality educational experiences is going to change the culture of them being ready for digital. I think that will just happen. So what I was encouraged about with that report was 100% of the people that uh, were part of your project uh, found it valuable. They may, not, yeah. they may not have said, well, you know, there's you know, technical issue here or uh, challenge here, or not quite ready for this, but 100% of them found it valuable. And that, to me, was a seed of change 
that I think you're helping to build because of the quality work that you're doing on the research side here at the university. So well done. And by, and by the way, our tour guide was from that community. And he spoke of that, uh, you know, the impact that those types of initiatives are going to have in his community. Yeah, Juan was from that community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah John. Bet, go ahead. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> no worries. Uh, pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I was having a conversation with a faculty member just before coming here, and we were debating about the value of traditional lecturing. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious because I, I, I see questions about sustainability, questions about the tools, uh, the turn of the tide in terms of digitalization and, and how you cannot escape that tide, if, if, if you will. That's right. Um, but yet, uh, uh, earlier, you were talking about soft skills uh, uh, in terms of the end user of the, the student. And I was wondering, um, thinking about that value of traditional lecturing, mm -hmm. uh, how a company like yours contributes to developing those skills for the teacher. Mm -hmm. Because then, in the end, or at the very bottom, there is uh, something very uh, unique to human beings about storytelling, mm -hmm. narrative, even in technical uh, uh, disciplines like engineering. Yeah, I agree. Right? Uh, yeah, y you can explain a vector in many ways, but then there is the right story yeah. to explain a vector. Yeah. And, and the one that has, that strikes the right tone with the students so you can reach everybody. Yeah. Uh, and then, that's not necessarily something about digital or not digital. That goes a little bit beyond that. And I wonder how a company like yours contributes to that for institutions like ours. Uh, this is a great question. And, and by the way, you're right. Storytelling matters. And vector, in particular, vectors. I, I was with Elon Musk, and he told me a story about vectors. I was, because how he told it. Right? He talked about how you know, your company could be going one direction, and people are thinking, that, that's like a vector. Like This group is doing this, and they think, well, I've accomplished so much. But uh, another part of the organization was accomplishing just as much, but just in the exact opposite direction. And you wound up going nowhere as a company, <laughs> because they were both pulling in different directions. And so storytelling, narrative, lectures, um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to do as much of uh, it, uh, as we did in the past around settled knowledge as a way to sort of like pass, as an effective way to teach settled knowledge. I really don't think we're going to do as much of it. I think we're going to be like active classrooms. I think we're going to be doing more competency-based learning and everything else. But I do think it is still a very effective way to tell stories, to engage, to inspire. But I don't know if you as a faculty member like to give a lecture every single day of every single, you know, week uh, of the year. But I, th I think there's going to be a, a place and a time for it. Uh, and so that you can put more energy into a higher quality experience and then spend more time on the active experiences or other types of models of learning. Uh, I was in, uh, have you ever seen the painting of the old lecture hall from like 400 years ago? Where it's like the, the, there's the pews and there's the lectern and then there's the bigger lectern for the professors. And if you're not the professor, you go down the lower lectern. You've seen the painting? I've actually been to that lecture hall. It's in Ghent. Uh, one of our clients you know, took us through as a tour, just like we're going through a tour today. And that lecture hall has not changed since that was painted 400 years ago. That lecture, but it's still an incredibly valuable tool for the university uh, to deliver very, very important conversations uh, and to tell very important stories. So I, I, I think, you know, in our case, we, we have like, technology that allows you to do like, lecture capture. So you can take that lecture and synchronize it and send it out to the world so they can watch the lecture over and over and over again. Uh, you can do closed captioning of the lecture to make it uh, accessible to folks. Uh, you can allow students to go back and rewatch. So that I know there was something really important. They could search all of their lectures, find that one exact moment where you talked about it, and play it again. So being able to go back and recall uh, 
if you've got students that uh, Spanish or English may not be their first language, those types of technologies that digitize those traditional lectures are incredibly important. Um, but how many think lectures by, you know, are going to go away? Like do you, does anyone here think lectures are going, how many think lectures are going to survive for a long time to come? Okay. Split, okay. So I, I do think there's going to be a balance. Like we said earlier, I think there's going to be a, a good spot for a lecture. But I, as an engineer, I can tell you, sitting there writing down everything that was written on the chalkboard as a lecture was not a great experience for every, every lecture. But some stories were incredibly valuable, and I really appreciated those. Uh, so it's just getting the, the right balance, I think, is going to be the important part. But I, I do think you're going to see more active classrooms. I do think you're going to see other models of learning start to pop up in a more meaningful way. And, and, then, and then going back to the scale question, right? It's a new way to teach. Like, I, I'm not comfortable in a room like this yet teaching or giving a lecture or giving a talk. Uh, it's going to take time for these things to be embraced, but when they become embraced, uh, it's going to be hard to go back to a traditional experience. And if I may follow up on that, and do you have or, or uh, do you pursue any effort on trying to ease the pressure on faculty for that kind of transition? Uh, we spend a lot of time on that, yeah. So, uh, so we have our like our, we do. We have a lot of folks that are in our research and user experience lab, and uh, we do thousands of design sessions with faculty all over the world. Uh, I think we're just about to set up an advisory board here in Columbia, if I'm not mistaken. Cami is going to be helping us with that, uh, and we're going to try to pull together all these ideas and try to say, you know, here is, here's how we can improve our technology to better support, better facilitate, better create uh, a, a better experience. Uh, and I can share a couple stories on that. But, I'll, but I'll, on the other side of it is, how do we provide better professional development? How do we help you know, uh, tell a better story as, as you make that transition? Uh, in one of your active classrooms, there was, I don't see it in this room, but there was like a little picture of like, here's how you can run an active classroom with a little infographic on like the different types of active classrooms you can set up. There are strategies that we can employ to say, well, here's a way to do like a fishbowl exercise as part of a discussion online. Or here's how we can, you know, create an active experience online versus it being in a traditional classroom. There are a lot of things we could do around professional development for that. We have a lot of that already online. Uh, we now need to sort of build up the capacity here to actually really roll it out. Uh, and we have clients in the region that do nothing but professional development for faculty and for, for teachers. Um, and at scale, it's hard. Right? Because a lot of it, a lot of PD traditionally was face-to-face, -face, kind of like what we're doing right now. Uh, in Din Indonesia, we're running a project right now where we're trying to scale it to three million teachers, professional development. Uh, and they were doing it face-to-face, -face, and they, were only, they only ever, in a particular year, ever got to 10,000 teachers in a traditional way. Online, we've already helped them reach over 100,000, and we're well on our way to the first million. Uh, uh, and, you know, it is a great way to start to scale these practices and to, to get the right reach. And it's particularly challenging. I don't know if you have the challenge here, but there, two million out of the three million are not qualified to be teachers, even though they are teachers. And they're also short another two million teachers on top of those three million. So they really have a four million teacher shortage or retraining or upskilling or reskilling challenge in that country. I don't know how, the, how we could do that in any other way other than digital. I, I really don't. We can't build schools fast enough. And if you look at higher education globally, when I started in higher education, there's 100 million students in higher education globally. There's now over 160 million, and we're well on our way to a quarter of a billion, possibly 300 million in the next 10 years. We can't build campuses fast enough. You're landlocked here, right? So I, I think you've got a, a river on one side, apartment buildings on another side, right? You can start buying apartment buildings, I guess, and turning them into campus space. But eventually, uh, the, the digital has to come into play. Uh, Waterloo in Canada, the University of Guelph in Canada, think about half the course load for face-to-face -face students is going to be digital in the next five plus years. Half. They're, they're, they're around 10 to 25 percent now, depending on which university you're talking about, but half. So what does that mean? It means you can have probably twice as many students on campus because you're able to now provide course load online along with the ones that are actually they're attending in class. Just, you know, there's all kinds of new models to help gain scale. But the traditional lecture, 
doesn't scale to uh, uh, achieve the, the demand that's out there in the market. I hope, yeah. Well, but, but, but we can even make that, yeah. A lecture doesn't necessarily mean uh, in person. But in person. In person, yeah. Right. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And, uh, and probably my favorite example of a, of a teacher anywhere is like a traditional lecturer. She was a, an adjunct lecturer at Deakin University, a young, you know, uh, sectional, if you will, like a young junior associate. I don't know what they're called down in Australia. I should know this. Uh, associate professor, but not a professor. Um, she's now a professor. She now has a research uh, group that she's working with. She just won Teacher of the Year. Uh, and what she did was use our technology to help the traditional lecture, in her case, 2,000 students, uh, be a better experience. And so 2,000 students in her lectures uh, in the past would have about 60% completion rate. So 40% of the students would not complete, 60% would complete. Uh, today, she has, uh, in some places, upwards of 98.5% completion rate in that 2,000 seat lecture because of how we've transformed how we give feedback and how we keep those students on track for success using digital tools to help scale great feedback. Uh, so you can. I think the, the lifetime of a, a lecture has been extended because of digital. Um, and you can create better experiences using those types of uh, tools. And she's a great, great proof point on that. You know, uh, uh, you know, like strategies, like I love, like, uh, like if there's one topic, feedback, 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 feedback. In her case, she leaves uh, video, audio feedback. She's done the research. Like if you cough, carry on. Students love authentic feedback. Uh, <laughs> you know, just like uh, focus on giving those students a reason to persist through that program. It makes a big difference. That was a lot of questions. Uh, so the, sh the short answer is uh, our core platform collects all the data, and we provide you access to that data as part of our base offering. So um, uh, it used to be in a Hadoop cluster. We've moved it into Kinesis and a whole bunch of other technologies in Amazon to make it scalable, because some of our clients event billions of transactions a day. So uh, these are big, big data sets, big data. Uh, challenges. So for 10 years, we've had machine learning, which is a sub-domain of artificial intelligence, as a core technology within D2L for a long time. So it's, uh, so what, what have we been able to do? We've been able to predict if a student's going to be successful before they start a course. Uh, we've been able to uh, predict which students are going to drop out of a course. Uh, and we've been able to predict uh, what learning pathway is more optimized for you uh, the outcomes from that uh, tend to be higher completion rates. So completion rates tend to go up, retention goes up, graduation rates go up, um, engagement goes up. Uh, there's case study after case study after case study on all of this. Uh, we've had things published in Fortune, Economist, all kinds of different publications around the work that we were doing there. We marketed it wrong. And I think there's a lesson there for our clients in how we approached it. We, because we talked about it as a way to accomplish something, but, uh, but it really should be just, it's just another data point. And one of my clients, uh, La Cité, uh, in, it's a French, it's the largest Francophone college in Ontario, taught me something. So we, we give them all the predictions. Uh, and I think you have access to all the predictions too if you really wanted them. 
So I, I, don't, I don't think there's extra, I think you've already got it as part of the package that you've already got. Um, they, they have access to those predictions, but they have the faculty member twice a semester go red, yellow, green. And I said, well, why do you have the faculty member doing that? Like our technology does that. Why do you have the faculty member sharing that data with the students? Why don't we just share it directly with the students? And they said something that actually matters. No, the faculty owns whether the student is engaged or on track for completion. It's their, uh, it's that agency is around the faculty member. And, uh, and it goes back to the predictions just yet another data point. And so if we can uh, share more data points with faculty or students, then they can make a judgment call. They can take the right actions uh, and make the right call. And that's gonna allow them to outperform. All the papers that we've done on this say that the more a faculty member looks at these predictions, the completion rates just go up, just correlated to how often they look at it. Uh, because they're uh, equipped with better data to make a better judgment call. But I, I don't think you should have this be the judgment machine. I, like I, I think uh, that's where AI has sort of gotten a bad rap. And I think uh, if we can keep the human in the mix, it makes a big difference. It's like um, sports, Moneyball. Does that translate well here? Uh, you've heard of Moneyball, the movie about uh, how, like, baseball, this has been a big thing where, you know, if you're not doing analytics, then you're not going to be the top of the league uh, because they're, they're leveraging data to make predictions. Well, there's a lot of people that can do analytics, but nobody has let the analytics person run the baseball team, right? Just like there's no one's going to, uh, the person that runs analytics doesn't run the classroom. Uh, you still need the person to make the judgment calls, right? Like, should I pull the goalie? The analytics is saying yes. I'm saying, well, no, <laughs> right? Not, you know, it might be an interesting prediction, but it's not the right call at this right moment. And so the, the ability to sharpen our skills uh, using this type of data is going to become more and more important. So you're going to see more of this start to uh, roll out with D12 in the near future. Uh, but right now, uh, you know, it's all about just helping you chart the right answers. Yeah. Now, the, yeah, we can go on for a while on that one, but, but the key is trying to make this as available as much as possible. Okay, thank you, John, for your time, for your ideas, for sharing your insights with us. As I said, this is part of a conversation which we hope to continue. Digital and curricular transformation. And what we hope is that this is the beginning of a conversation and to have more frequent content in the meetings that we have in different settings. So again, thank you, John, for being with us. Thank you all for coming. And thank you.